I hope this is so far clear. I present the same idea to you again, this time explaining to you that the dot or the point in the middle which represent the effect size and the line which represent the confidence interval, these dots weighted according to the confidence interval, the width of the confidence interval, can then be lumped together in what is called meta-analysis. This is also done by a software, uh, and you can find several freely available software or online calculators to do this. And what they allow you to do is to create a diamond. This diamond has effect size in the middle of the diamond, and the ends of the diamond represent the confidence interval. So what we have done in this diagram is that we have taken all the dots, we have given each dot a weight. The weight depends on the width of the confidence interval. And we have added all the dots weighted according to the width of the confidence interval. And the summary result, when all these dots are put together, is in this diamond. This is uh, a meta-analysis. So I now take you to the next slide. Here you see the same thing that I described to you previously in words. But now you can see that the dots in the middle have been increased in size according to the weight allocated to the study in the meta-analysis. So a large study, which as you know from before, it had around 200 people, had a weight of 32% in this analysis. And a small study, for example, the one with only 20 people, has weight of only 1.2% in this meta-analysis. And you can see that according to the weight, we then create a summary result. Now, the methods of doing meta-analysis can also be different. I present to you random and fixed effect. Here you can see that according to the method used, the weight changes. So without going into detail, the idea should be that we use uh, a conservative method of meta-analysis, which typically tends to be the random effects model. And you can see that the weight changes uh, as soon as we move from a fixed effect to random effect model. I presume by now some of you are quite confused. So I'm going to take a little break and ask for you to quiz me on any questions that you might have. Please keep the questions coming. So the first question asked by Hamza is, can the result of meta-analysis be biased as many times researchers 
don't find a significant correlation between independent and dependent variables. Hamza, you asked me a question. I need to make a lot of assumptions about your knowledge of what is a dependent variable, what's a dependent variable, what is a correlation, what is a significant correlation before I can really answer your question. Maybe Hamza, you can define what you mean by bias because once I know your definition of bias, I can probably answer your question more straightforwardly. Nimra, you asked me, confidence interval fixed converted to confidence interval random. So Nimra, the straightforward question is, uh, answer is, the confidence interval remains the same when we move from fixed to random effects model, the confidence interval does not change. What changes is the weighting attached, the system of weighting for calculation. So random effects model is a bit more generous to smaller studies. So for example, a study that was weighed only around one or two percent in the fixed effect model in the example that we have in front of us it was its weight was raised this one for example was raised to around two or three percent to three percent so it doubled so you can see that the weight changes here 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 on the other hand a larger study the weight was reduced to 25% from 32. Look, in order to tell you the formula required, really what you need is to do a degree in statistics. So I urge us not to worry too much about the exact formula, but to conceptually understand what we are discussing. Another question, can we use SPSS for meta-analysis? Uh, Moise, yes, SPSS can be used for meta-analysis. Nimra, thank you for accepting my response that uh, instead of the mathematics, we should try to understand it conceptually. Uh, Delhi asked me, sample size, length of confidence interval translated into its weight yes that is correct Delhi. Uh, a formula is used to convert the length of the confidence interval by using a calculation called variance so you can see that in order for me to explain to you the formula you first need to know what is variance then you need to know what is inverse of variance and then you can begin to think about what is the formula. The bottom line is variance is related to the length or width of the confidence interval or the line, which is related to the sample size and the number of outcomes. So these things go into the formula. In data extraction, you need to you need the results of the study. That is correct, Mois. So what you need when you are extracting data is this information. So you can see, Mois, that this information is the data extracted. One out of 14 in the treatment group, one out of 15 in the control group, and so on per study. From this data, we can calculate relative risk and confidence interval. From this information, we can put this information in a meta-analysis model, depending on the type of fixed effect model or random effect, and we can create this diamond. This diamond is the sum of the individual results weighted according to a formula 
for the width of the confidence interval, taking into account width of the confidence interval. Hamza, now come to explain to me what you mean by bias. Okay, Hamza, the first thing to recognize is that a statistical significance has nothing to do with bias. Hamza, when I say statistical significance has nothing to do with bias, I am not sure you understand what I mean. If you understand what I mean, then I can proceed to answer your question. If you don't understand what I mean, then you need to first understand what is the difference between bias and statistical significance. Then I can go on to address your question. Ah, so Hamza, you understand the difference between significance and bias. Uh, take the microphone and explain it to your colleagues, Hamza. Please do that. I would really appreciate it. Hamza, you can turn on your mic as you're one of the panelists. You can interact with sir directly. Well, look, Hamza, Anybody else who is prepared to take the mic can help Hamza explain it to colleagues. Anybody else would make an attempt to explain what Hamza wishes to explain? Uh, sir, he's probably uh referring to publication bias i guess that studies with negative findings or those uh, who are unable to find a significant association or significant results uh, are usually not very much welcomed by the journals and that's why in when we are doing our systematic review or meta analysis uh, we are never able to include those studies in our meta analysis maybe that's what he's referring to okay thank you for explaining that javad so hamza you explained uh, that yes you are referring to publication bias all right, so publication bias is something highly specific to the performance of meta-analysis. When we refer to publication bias, we refer to the following. Here I present to you a result of a study here is the point estimate. Here is the confidence interval. The confidence interval crosses the value one or includes the value one. Whenever this happens, it means that the result is not statistically significant. I hope this is understood by colleagues in the, in the audience. So I take you back to this previous slide. In this diagram you can see that none of the results are statistically significant because the confidence interval include the value one here we have another result is this result statistically significant what would the colleagues say Okay, so that's very good. I, I, I'm happy with the answer. All of you said, yes, this result is statistically significant. Is, are there two results statistically significant? Both of the results are statistically significant. Which of these two results is more likely to be published? 
you can see that both of the results are statistically significant but one of the results shows that placebo or control is better the other result shows that treatment is better the result that is more likely to be missing from the literature or being affected by publication bias is this one so hamza and jawad i hope i have explained well that statistical significance alone is not responsible for missing studies whether the statistical significance is associated with the treatment being effective or the treatment not being effective is also associated with publication bias that does that make sense yes sir it does <clears throat> okay hamza thank you for also confirming that it makes sense you can also see that both of these studies are small because their confidence intervals are quite wide compared to this study this study is not statistically significant but it is a large study because its confidence intervals are small do you believe that this study is likely to be published or not published because this is a large study it is more likely to be published regardless of the possibility of the result being significant or not yes hafsa uh, thanks for for confirming a study with a large sample size is more likely to be published whether or not it is statistically significant so with this idea we take forward the idea of what is called funnel plot so we take a funnel put it upside down put all the studies inside it with effect size on this axis study size on this axis and if the studies are spread across the spectrum then we say that there is no publication bias but if there is missing studies then we say there is publication bias so we try to understand this with an example here we have a published paper which says that a particular treatment is better for improving pregnancy outcomes this is a meta analysis where they have combined various studies you can see this study is statistically significant the diamond does not include the value one so it is also statistically significant when all of these studies are put together in a meta analysis this meta analysis statistically significant however when we plot the funnel we can see that studies here are missing in this analysis it is not possible to conclude that this statistically significant result shows that the treatment is effective do you agree with what i just said colleagues So you can now see that by taking into account sample size, okay, Hafsa, you are asking me to repeat it. You can see that this result is statistically significant. In studies, the dots are plotted in this diagram against a measure of sample size or width of confidence interval we can see that some studies are possibly missing when there are when there is a risk of missing studies in a meta analysis the overall result cannot be fully trusted <clears throat> in this paper 
The authors have concluded that this treatment is effective, but an intelligent reader, all of you, after attending my session, will be able to see that this conclusion cannot be trusted. Moiz, so you are saying we need more different and variety of studies instead of number of studies. Hafsa, thank you for confirming you got it. Uh, Moiz, you, we don't always need more studies. We need those studies that are missing. When the studies are missing, we need to understand why they are missing. The solution for avoiding missing studies is to register studies before they are started. So when all the studies that will ever be done are registered, then a meta-analyst can go to all the people who ever registered a study and ask them to share their data. This is the solution to the problem we are just now discussing. It makes sense? I hope, Moiz. Okay, so we now bring this presentation to a conclusion. Thank you, Mois, for confirming that my explanation was clear. I go directly to our last few slides in the interest of time. I was asked earlier, what is grading, evidence grading? Um, evidence grading considers study design. This is normally called grade A or level A evidence. But when we perform a systematic review with meta-analysis, we can get additional information and our grading can be more informed. In this particular systematic review, there are some issues about the limit or limitations about the studies. <clears throat> and as a result of these limitations, we can legitimately downgrade the evidence and reduce the assessment of its quality. So you can see that the process that we just went through, where we assess studies for their uh, effect size and the width of the confidence interval and whether or not there are any missing studies, and we put all this information together. The simple grading of studies based on whether it's randomized or not can be regraded. So with this, I bring my presentation to close. I'm afraid we didn't have time today to go through the tips that I wanted to give you concerning uh, how to write up a meta-analysis so that a journal editor can uh, accept it more easily. But Javad, I think it's time for me to stop, given that we have 90 minutes. Let, uh... Uh, sir, I originally set the meeting at uh, 150 minutes just to be on the safe side. But uh, yes, uh, I think we should conclude it now. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Hafsa asking me why meta-analysis goes at the top of the research hierarchy. And Nimra is asking, we can stay longer. I have no problem. I can stay longer. Uh, what I would request is, I would ask colleagues who have questions to please put all your questions now. I take a very short break to switch on the light in the room where I am, because here now we are having a sunset. and. Zishan is asking for another session. I will happily be available for another session, another day, without any problem. I'll be back in just a second. Okay, so uh, 
I think I take Hafsa's question first. Why is uh, meta-analysis at the top of the research hierarchy? Hafsa, you might already know that uh, expert opinion is at the bottom of the research hierarchy. The reason why meta-analysis is at the top of the research hierarchy is it allows you to examine all the available evidence, examine and reanalyze it, And for this reason, the information contained in a meta-analysis is usually more than information contained in a single study. And for this reason, because the totality of the evidence is present and analyzed and transparently presented, this allows for meta-analysis to reach the top of the research hierarchy. I hope that makes it clear, Hafsa. Okay, uh, uh, Moise wishes to, uh, to share the top tips. So I will do that quickly once I've covered some questions. And uh, Jawad, I'm happy to stay longer, as I said. So. With your permission, we will continue. Um, A sure thing to do, so you can continue. Thank you. Hafsa, your comment is whether meta-analysis is more scientific. I don't think that is correct. I think a single study can also be highly scientific so i i'm not exactly sure what you mean by scientific but what i can say is meta analysis is transparent transparent is everything is out in the open clear obvious for anybody to see understand reanalyze reinterpret if they want i think that is what to me makes meta analysis more uh, valuable. Okay, so the tips for writing a paper. We jump directly to what is important. I think it's important you know that the, the title, abstract, introduction, and tables and figures are more important than the rest of the text in any publication. Another day I can tell you why in detail. But with respect to a meta-analysis paper, I urge you that the abstract should be written according to a structure. If the journal does not wish you to report a structured abstract, after writing the structured abstract, you can then remove the subheadings and convert the text into a paragraph. For the title, I urge you to put the word meta-analysis inside the title. If you do not use the, the technique meta-analysis in your systematic review, in that case, just call it a systematic review. Then what you write in the ob objective section of the abstract, ensure that that text is repeated and is correlated, is coherent, is similar, is exact replica of the abstract in the time so that when editor read your paper, they can see that you are a logical person who can move from abstract to introduction and do not say two different things about your objective. And then refer to that, the fact that you have used meta-analysis, both in abstract and the last paragraph of the introduction. 
Okay, in the introduction, you write why you have undertaken the work. In this case, it is important for you to explain whether a previous meta-analysis exists, whether the quality of the meta-analysis is good or bad, and what is the need for you to do a new meta-analysis. For example, the last one may have been done 10 years ago, in which case you have a justification to carry out a new meta-analysis. And this is a checklist for assessing the quality of a previous meta-analysis, M star 2. Then coming to discussion, this is the structure for a discussion. The weaknesses that you wrote of the previous meta-analysis, you can discuss them again in the discussion in the third paragraph. In the introduction, you discuss the previous meta-analysis with respect to why your review is justified. In the discussion, you compare their findings with yours in order to explain how your findings are different or similar to theirs. So with this, I bring my presentation to an end uh, with my key points are that individual studies can be variable, small in size, difficult to find as a reader. Systematic reviewer make the reader's job easier by doing the literature searches, presenting the studies together in a meta-analysis, which improves the precision. And this allows us to, to improve our ability to carry out research-based practice. Uh, Sufyan is asking for sharing the slides. Um, Javad, I'm already sent you the slides by email. So I'm very happy for you to share. But I can also confirm that Javad is going to provide us a video which will be uploaded onto my YouTube channel. Javad, I think I hand back to you in the interest of time to okay, sir, close the uh, meeting. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. So now that the Q&A session is over, I'd like to thank you, uh, thank our speaker, Dr. Khalid Saeed Khan, who took his time out of a very busy schedule uh, to enlighten us on these topics. Uh, sir, it has really it was uh, really an informative and a wonderful session. And we have noted the request uh, from the participants to hold more sessions with Dr. Khalid Saeed Khan. And uh, from now onwards, uh, I'm going to be in contact with Sir continuously. So uh, maybe we can work on that and inshallah we'll come up uh, with more sessions uh, with Sir, where uh, you know quite a lot of people can benefit from that. So uh, uh, with this, I'd like to close the today's session and I hope everyone's queries were answered in a very comprehensive way. I'm thankful that most of the times we have to uh, leave the queries because of time constraints uh, of the speakers, but this time we were able to get all of them answered in a very comprehensive way. And I'd really, really thank uh, Sir Khalid for, for, for the comprehensive answers. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, with this, I'd like to close today's session. Thank you everyone for coming. Allah Hafiz. Bye-bye.